So by the time you come to the table, talk to an agent, tell them exactly what you want, what you need, you're gonna be fully prepared. So step one is study and research, watching videos like this, getting educated, right? Taking a look at my case studies, looking at other YouTube channels, reading articles, reading books, really put yourself through an education phase, right? And really consider taking 30, 60, 90 days to just absorb material, take notes, write questions down. Take notes, write questions down. Search those questions on the internet, see if you can get those answered for free. Hear that answer from three different people, see if they all align. Are they all saying the same thing or are they saying three different things? Okay, okay, so now I gotta go down these rabbit holes to figure out where is the truth, right? If we, if we seek truth in the marketing, that's really gonna help you be prepared even more by the time you talk to someone because by the time you talk to an agent, remember that agent, their job is to sell you, right? Educate you, teach you on say their ideas, their philosophies. You, you wanna have your own way of thinking coming to the table, preferably. A very good marketer, a very good salesman will try to get you to unthink, right? Get you to unlearn what you think you know so that they can plant a new idea inside of you. And then, so it's a dance, right? This is what it is, it's a dance. And so if you buy into someone else's philosophy, you're now in their world. I would just simply say, understand their world. Seek the truth in all of their world and see if it matches up with your values and principles. If you don't come to the table with morals, values, and principles, someone else is gonna feed that inside of you. And again, it's gonna be a dance and you might end up being led in the dance as opposed to being a leader in the dance right? Deciding whether we go left, light, left, right, spin you around, okay? All that good stuff. <clears throat> so now coming back to the whiteboard. Six steps, study, research. Step two, choose the agent. Step three, choose the company. Now, this is not in the best order, I'll be honest, but these are critical things that, you know, I, for sure you're going to study and research. And more than likely when you go through someone's funnel, you might end up talking to an agent maybe prematurely, which is fine, right? You're just kind of getting educated, right? And you want to set the standard. Hey, I want to get educated. I'm not necessarily ready to design a policy at this morning, at this moment, but I would like to get educated. Where can you point me? What kind of conversations can we have right now to help me prepare myself for eventually getting a policy? I don't know if I want to go with you or your team. I'd like to get to know you first, build a relationship. Is that cool? Yes, no. And you kind of see how people react. So essentially you're choosing the agent. The agent is going to help you choose the company. They're going to present companies to you. Now, again, through your study and research, you might already choose a company. You might do the homework in advance, right? And my uh, Word docs might help you do that. Then step four is choose the design, okay? What kind of whole life insurance design contract would you like? High early cash value up front, mid cash value up front, low cash value up front, right? Ideally, in my personal opinion, the higher the cash value, the more efficiently I'm going to be doing the infinite banking concept. That's just my personal opinion. I don't see a world in my personal finances where it makes any sense at all for me to have less than 80%, 70% of my initial dollar amount. Like if I'm paying in a hundred grand, I want to see in the neighborhood of at least 80% or more in cash value upfront. I don't see a world in my personal finances where it makes sense to have 60% of my cash value upfront or 50% of my cash value upfront. It means I put in 100 and I only see 50. Put in 100, I only see 60. I really just do not see a world where that makes any sense whatsoever. All right, so that's my personal opinion, right? You may not agree with that. For most clients, you agree with most likely having more cash value upfront. It's usually the agent that will convince you to take lower cash value. And then again, it's a dance. It's like you need to figure out, well, why is that? Why do they want me to have lower cash value up front when I'm funding this policy? So choosing the design is going to be unique. And within design, not just how much went to cash and how much went to cost of insurance, but we're also deciding on different riders. Like there's a, a popular rider called waiver of premium. Waiver of premium rider is a monthly fee, I believe monthly or it could be paid annual, however, and that covers you in the event you cannot pay your premium, right? That'll kick in. I don't know for how long or whatever, but it provides that level of protection and time for you to come up with the funds to pay the policy. Me personally, if I have such a low base premium design, say for example, I'm paying in 
$100,000 a year into a policy. If I have a $50,000 base premium, that's a massive premium, I would put waiver premium on that. But take the same 100 grand and give me a $15,000 base premium or a $10,000 base premium. Uh, if I already have the ability to fund 100,000 a year, paying in a minimum of 10 to 15,000 that covers all my insurance expense, I don't see the need of having waiver of premium on my policy. So that's gonna reduce the cost, which means more money's gonna go to cash value. So that's just me. I wouldn't want that on there, right? And again, there's other riders. There's like a long-term care rider, the uh, disabilities and all kinds of different riders. There's free ones and then there's paid ones, right? So you being able to go through the policy with the agent, having them articulate those to you is important. So that's again, choosing the design. You're really not gonna get to choose the design. You're not gonna get to this point unless you've you know, done your research, studied, you're talking to an agent, and the agent is now designing a policy with a company, and then you're now having discussion about it. Once you've chosen the design, now you're in underwriting, right? You say, okay, this is what I wanna go with. Now you go through underwriting. You apply for life insurance. It usually takes about, a, you know, maybe two months max. Could be a little bit longer depending on how slow the insurance company moves or how long it takes you to book your medical exam, right? Underwriting can sometimes take a month, two months, just depends. Then you get to the point where you now need to fund it. Okay, I want to pay him 50 grand a year. Okay, cool. Boom. Sign the contract, ACH, boom. Fund it, close, done. Agent gets paid. You get your account. You now have a policy. You are now insured. Final step is performing the strategy that you and the agent went over. What are we using this Four. Again, if you get sold on this core value, anything you add on top of core value is going to be an added benefit. So let's look at the strategy, right? Or different strategies that you will hear content creators like myself talk about. So as it relates to step six, performing the strategy as it relates to the infinite banking concept. You can use a whole life insurance contract to leverage the available liquid cash value to invest and you can create interest earnings in two locations, right? You could be earning money with the same dollar in two locations, right? For example, let's say you had $1 in cash value and it's earning an internal rate of return of, especially in the, let's say in the first year, okay, it's going to be negative, say 15%. You're actually not going to be earning anything. So you need, to, you need to understand that. So that's like, oh, wait a minute. What's happening here? This is going to take time for this dollar in the cash value living benefit. It's going to take time for that dollar to really grow for real, right? It's going to take some time. When I say time, it's going to take a couple years for it to really grow. But let's say year one, day one, you borrow $1, right? So, well, if you have a total of $1 in cash value, you're only gonna be able to borrow up to 90%. So let's use my um, my leverage rule. And let's say we only borrow 60 cents from the cash value. At this point, you borrowed 60 cents, you're earning an interest rate on the full dollar as if you didn't borrow it in the first place. Now, the insurance company is gonna charge you an interest rate on 60 cents. So whatever 60 cents times 5% in a year is, that would be the most amount of interest that you would pay in a year. The interest is calculated, simple interest, daily compounding, right? So the interest will compound over a period of time, and then the interest doesn't actually have to get paid until the anniversary date, okay? So you have the option to pay your interest up front early or pay it on the anniversary date. But either way, you have a cost. Now, meanwhile, this full dollar is going to earn a rate of return but in the beginning, it's gonna be negative. Now, what you do with this 60 cents is to your personal preference. If you think that taking this 60 cents and going to earn 6% and you're gonna call that positive arbitrage, you're doing bad math, promise you. You're already in the hole, negative 15. You would need to earn 15, five, you need to earn 20 plus percent or more just to break even on this whole thing, just to break even on this whole plan here. That would not make sense. So that's why you wanna get clear on, wait a minute, do I actually wanna do this?